Greetings, everyone. Welcome to another presentation of History Up Close from the National Naval Aviation Museum. My name is Dwayne Thiessen. I'm the President and CEO of the Naval Aviation Museum Foundation, and it's our honor to bring you these presentations each week. When you come back to our museum, we're very proud of the fact that you can have an up-close and personal experience with most of our exhibits. And there's also a very good chance that you're going to get to physically meet and talk to volunteers and docents who are here in our museum who have personal experience with these various exhibits. That's exactly what we're bringing to you today. We have a retired Marine named Shep who has done a great deal of flying in this kind of airplane, Shep Brown. In this kind of airplane, he has personally flown the President of the United States. Now think about it. He's here in this museum with an artifact, an exhibit, that he's going to talk about from a personal experience. I'm going to turn it over to Shep and let him give you his experiences and talk about this airplane. Major Brown. Good morning, folks. My name is Shep Brown. I'm a retired Marine aviator and now a volunteer at the museum in the Visitor Support Division. We help our guests make the most enjoyable visit possible when they come to see our various aircraft and displays. Uh, it's really my honor to be part of this History Up Close series for this particular aircraft that's special to me and to most Americans. It's the VH-3A model, better known to most as Marine One. It's probably the most photographed helicopter in the world uh, for various reasons. I'm gonna do my uh, presentation today kind of in three parts. The mission, the aircraft, and then the squadron that flies uh, these very unique uh, machines. So this all started in 1957 when Ike, President Eisenhower, was flying around Washington, D.C. in the small Bell H-13, which we have up here, uh, a similar model. Um, pretty, uh, pretty nice machine for local travel. But then later that year, he had to leave Rhode Island expeditiously, and he got in a Marine UH-34, which was the workhorse of the Marines and the Army in Vietnam. Fabulous <clears throat> machine. Um, and that was 1957. And all of a sudden, the White House realized there is something to this. So in 1958, the White House helicopter mission was created, and that was done with the VH-34D, a fancier version with a white top of the old UH-34. And the Army and the Marines shared this mission from 1958 in the VH-34 until 1976. So in 1963, the White House got the brand new VH-3A. This is a variant of the H-3 series that the Navy, Air Force, and Coast Guard has flown. It flew as a rescue aircraft, it chased subs, and it recovered uh, astronauts. Um, it was uh, flown by the Army and the Marines. Then in 1976, the powers to be decided the Marine Corps would be doing this by themselves. And that's when um, uh, the Executive Flight Detachment was formed uh, in HMX-1, Marine Helicopter Squadron 1. And so they, um, they, flew, the, uh, they flew the VH, 3A then, that was brand new. The VH-3A is a variant from the H-3 series, 
which uh, was very well known as a rescue aircraft, um, Apollo astronaut recovery aircraft, um, and sub submarine chaser in the Navy's uh, mission. So the aircraft model flew with the Navy, Air Force, uh, and the uh, Coast Guard. They flew the Pelican, which we also have here at the museum. Now I have a little, a little bit of a, a trivia fact here. In 1962, the Navy and Sikorsky together broke the world speed record. Actually three of them with the VH3 flying 183 miles an hour over uh, Connecticut and the Long Island Sound. Quite a feat in its day. Then in 1976, when the Marine Corps got the mission by itself, the brand new VH3D model came along. Nobody knows about the B or C model, neither do I. But this is pretty much the same aircraft, um, and we'll talk about that in more detail later on. Um, okay, what's coming? Next year in 2021, the Sikorsky VH-92 will become the new White House aircraft for the White House military office. That's um, best predictions. If you pay attention on July 4th, you might see one flying around on television. Okay, now I'd like to go to the aircraft itself, the VH-3. Uh, for some numbers, uh, Everybody in aviation loves numbers, and I'm just gonna throw a couple out to you. Um, I'm sure I'll get more on the question period. Uh, the aircraft can fly 140 knots. Let's just say 150 miles an hour. These blades that are folded on the A model are 27 feet long. Each one weighs 212 pounds, and there are five of them. That's a pretty good, uh, pretty good number. Um, the aircraft weighs maximum 20,500 pounds. The main rotor system up there, everybody thinks it spins terribly fast. It only spins 203 revolutions per minute. Then as we learned last week, the importance of a tail rotor from our skipper, Captain Kinslow, the tail rotor on this aircraft spins at 1,243 RPM. Pretty fast because it has to. Okay, now let's look at the aircraft itself kind of. First look at the beautiful paint job. It's a unique green, okay? This is Marine One green. Um, a plaque is always in place, depending who is being flown. This is the presidential plaque. The vice presidential plaque is very similar with a white background. Um, well, I'll talk about that a little bit later too. Okay. Um, up on the top, we have two powerful GE T-58-400 engines, about 1,500 horsepower each. At the squadron, they're known as white glove engines. These engines are prepared and overhauled by maintenance technicians that have been working on the T-58 for many, many years. The engine has been around for a very long time with the military. Forward of the engines is the ice barrier. We call it an ice barrier, but it's really a FOD, Foreign Object Damage Protector. It keeps stuff from getting sucked into the engine, which was done on most helicopters. Uh, we have one helicopter on display, the Coast Guard H-52, that never had a barrier. I don't know why that was. Um, for aviators, a very unique feature of this aircraft is the landing gear. The landing gear is visible from the cockpit. On final approach, the pilot on the left side would say, I have a gear and a life. 
The pilot on the right says, I have a gear and a light. That is a distinct advantage, retractable gear. Many pilots would really like to have that. Uh, let's slide down the left side a little bit. This mesh our guests are always very interested in. This is the air conditioning exhaust. And in certain situations, it does make quite a bit of noise. We have to be able to air condition this cabin sometimes for several hours before there is any power on the aircraft. Okay, how is it done? On the right sponson is a small turboshaft engine about this big, 95 horsepower. On the ground, it's what powers the air conditioning to keep things nice and cool. If you see on television, very often the doors are open in a hot environment. Trust me, the air conditioning is running and it's not for the pilots. Okay, now let's talk about um, one of the more fun parts of the aircraft and that's the cabin. The cabin, um, as you can see, has a number one seat where President Nixon uh, he was known as Searchlight in Secret Service uh, code names. He's in the number one seat. He gets the face forward, okay, as a president should. The seat opposite him is seat number two, where I assume Pat Nixon flew quite a bit. Her code name was Starlight, by the way. Then on inside the cabin of port and starboard, which is left and right, are two long bench seats. They will have guest cards printed uh, very formally where they're supposed to sit. And that's where they will take their places. Most guests are known to take the seat cards with them as a memento, perfectly, perfectly acceptable. All the way aft inside is the head. And right next to it is a refreshment bar pretty much near uh, the aft door. There are two very small seats, and I'm told very uncomfortable, where the Secret Service sits. One by the aft air stair door, and one by the forward uh, air stair door. Um, two items uh, I wanted to add before were, this is a basically a Navy H3 derivative. So I don't know if the camera can get it, but it has a very small tail wheel, not like the monster tail wheel that you saw on the H60. This is a definite challenge during pilot training, okay? Also, the tail pylon folds on hinges. It's still a Navy derivative, okay? On the VH3A, Obviously, the blades folded. The, uh, the VH-3 is actually a fairly complicated aircraft. This is due to its carrier-based heritage, which the SH-3 was carrier-based, and also due to the executive flight redundancy issues. Um, as an example, this aircraft, the VH-3, can be started three different ways, uh, each with pros and cons. Um, and it's definitely a challenge during pilot training where the pilots are coming from much more contemporary aircraft. The newer VH-3D is almost identical to the VH-3A. Um, it's a very popular executive aircraft for several reasons the impeccable safety record, the excess headroom in the cabin. I don't know offhand of any head of state that flies in their executive helicopter with this much headroom. In addition to that is the whisper quiet cabin inside and the ultra smooth ride on the D model. It has a bifiler rotor head, and it does not fold like this. It is truly um, an executive ride. Now, folks, uh, I'd like to 
talk about the squadron itself. It's the only squadron in the Marine Corps that flies the VH-3, which certainly is a challenge in many respects. The VH-3 at the squadron is flown by the Executive Flight Detachment of Marine Helicopter Squadron 1. The military acronym for that squadron is HMX-1, which experimental aviation was the primary focus. Flying for the White House now has pretty much become one of their primary missions. The squadron is renowned for its intense mission training, pilots and crews. It is also known for its zero defect mentality with regards to operations and maintenance. Every executive flight detachment Marine will be required to get the Yankee White clearance from the uh, Secret Service. A pilots normally will be a co-pilot for about a year uh, until they, um, until they uh, have finished their syllabus and they become a White House aircraft commander. Uh, every cockpit that you see flying normally has 5,000 hours or more in it. We're very proud of that fact. Uh, right now, I'd like to talk about executive lifts. They're actually flights, but of course we call them lifts. Um, it is a very carefully coordinated procedure between the pilots, the uh, crew chief, and the staff people on the ground. Uh, we have advanced people that coordinate every item of a lift in unbelievable detail. Um, of importance during a lift is to watch the very rehearsed movements of the, uh, the crew chief who will come out and nowadays open the aft door first, which is on the left side. He will lower it. He will march back and then take his position when he comes out. <clears throat> Most lifts, you will also see the Marine Guard in the front. This is get very carefully pre-briefed on how that's gonna happen. Also, during an approach and shutdown, landing and shutdown, whenever you see these videos and they're all out there, I want you to observe that there will never be a blade stopping over the forward air stair door. The pilots are very good at controlling this. Uh, this rotor head is also very unique, but they pride themselves on, on doing that. So we just finished talking about lifts. Uh, they're all very similar. They're never all exactly the same. Uh, it depends on the situation and what the staff wants. Uh, I'd like to show you some items now, a couple trinkets that the museum has, and some stuff that I kind of brought just to uh, maybe convince you I was, uh, I was actually once there. This is my Yankee White clearance before the days of retina scans and digital thumbprints. We actually wore these around our neck, and that was pretty much it. You were good to go. This is the very detailed list uh, for a executive lift of 35 years ago. Uh, it was typewritten and then probably mimeographed, but I doubt things have really changed too much. Um, Pre-briefing these lifts is critical, no matter how many times you've done it. <clears throat> this is the aviator's Bible. This is what you will know from cover to cover before you become a White House aircraft commander. Um, it's kind of old and dented too, but it's, it's the owner's manual. Every Navy and Marine aviator knows it is OPNAV 3710. Um, it tells you what you can and can't do, okay? Now we have some patches. Aviators love patches. Um, we all have patches here in the museum. This is my actual jacket from uh, 1980. If you're flying the president, you'll have the presidential patch. 
on your jacket, okay? If you're flying the vice president, you will have his patch on your jacket. We have a very nice portrait of Vice President Bush up on the second deck with his Vice President patch on, okay? This is the executive flight detachment patch, which you will wear probably on your nylon flight jacket if you're flying an executive mission, not the White House necessarily. There are two helicopters that have green tops. They are not for White House missions. They're for military VIPs, or of course, as directed. That's always there. <laughs> okay, now in the case here, this is our um, um, case of donated items. That's uh, very nice. I hope, um, can you get the picture of the seat cards? This is what everybody takes home. They are laid out on the bench seats. There are um, glasses, glassware from the cabin. They get taken home too. Uh, back in the days when people smoked, there was always presidential cigarette cases with White House matches also. Father on the side here, we have um, some White House napkins that of course would be served with the beverages in the back, okay? I can only assume it's still done today. This was uh, Major Gary Newman's uh, presidential flight jacket and some squadron caps. Um, the signage, welcome aboard Marine One is what is on the forward air stair door over here. Uh, now, this is a little more basic than the current VH3D, which has fairly luxurious carpeting on the air stairs and in the cabin. Okay, so uh, it's a very proud mission. Um, there's many, many people involved in doing it. It's a very large unit and we remain um, actually very close to each other. It's a brotherhood, generally a four year tour for um, pilots. Um, the maintainers can usually do more years there if they choose. Uh, it's purely a voluntary mission and you'll stay quite busy. So um, that pretty much does it for the, uh, the presentation. Um, I'd like you all to come back and visit us when possible to see the fabulous aircraft and other displays that we have here. And uh, I think now we're gonna slide into some questions and answers from you folks. Thanks a lot. Shep, that was awesome. Thank you so much. Um, we do have a few questions from our viewers today. The first one comes from Jim and it says, is it only supposed to be called Marine One when transporting the president? Very good uh, question, Jim. It is Marine One when the president's on board and only then. In the rare case, if he's in another aircraft, it has been called Navy One. But when it's not Marine One going for the president, usually it would be called Nighthawk One. Nighthawk is the HMX One call sign. Nighthawk One empty, Marine One or Marine Two. With the head of state on board, it normally would become State One. I hope that uh, answers your question, Jim. So we have a question from another um, another viewer today. It says, why is the helicopter that funny green color? The funny green color, it's, uh, we call it unique, okay? So when the mission started as a joint operation, Army and Marine Corps in 1958, just to be fair, they took marine green, which is very green, and then they took olive drab, the Army's color, and they mix it 50-50. And then we get the Marine One green. If you watch Marine One today, you'll notice it's a little more sparkly. It's got a little sparkle to it. And of course, the Marines have nicknamed this the Mountain Dew paint job, but it's still pretty much the way we see it. 
So what happened to the older VH3As? The VH3As uh, have gone uh, their, their separate ways. So I believe two of them went to HC2, which I think now is HCS2, and they, they were painted green on the top. And as we talked about earlier, th their tail said US Navy on them. Two more went to the East Coast to HC2 and said US Navy for VIP transport. There is one in the Nixon Library in California. There is one at President Reagan's library. Um, and then, of course, we have 613 here. So three are in libraries. Uh, four went to Navy squadrons for a while. And um, that doesn't account for the other two. And I'm not really sure. That information uh, is pretty hard to research. But 613 here actually um, was renovated by the Saberliner Corporation for the museum. And we got it here in 2011. So why is the top painted white? A pretty good question. Uh, legend has it that the top was painted white to help keep the cabin cool in the pre-air conditioning days of the VH-34. And of course, we don't want to change anything, so it remains white. There are, of course, two other aircraft that have green tops that are not for White House missions, just Marine VIP missions. So how many White House helicopters are there, actually? Actually, um, White House helicopters, there are 11. As I said before, it's slightly contradictory. Nine white tops VH helicopters, two green top helicopters. You will also see once in a while the smaller VH 60s, the White Hawk. If it's got a white top, it's a White House helicopter for White House missions. What was President Reagan's code name? President Reagan uh, was Rawhide. Um, very avid uh, horse rider, and Nancy was Rainbow. Um, it's always fun to research uh, presidents and their Secret Service code names. Uh, they're available online, and you need to check that out. While we know the common flight from the White House to Andrews and Camp David, what was the longest flight you made while the president was aboard? The longest flight that I know of, I was not in the VH, but actually uh, they were chasing me in my H-53. The longest flight that I know of was crossing the English Channel when we took President Reagan over to Point the Hawk on the 40th anniversary of Normandy. That was a, uh, I, from mem if memory serves, about 125 miles, and that's a, that's a long haul for Marine One. The next question comes from Michael, and he says, what defensive mechanisms does Marine One have? Defensive mechanisms. No weapon systems on board. There's a pretty elaborate electronic measures that are built in, um, but it's all, it's all being taken care of by other airborne assets. So Gregory says, has the first family pet ever flown on Marine One? Definitely, definitely. Um, I forget Reagan's uh, puppy, President Reagan's puppy, but they're all out on. If you search the internet, you'll see many, many pictures. Um, we're pet friendly, yes. Beth says, what's the most secret or impressive thing about Marine One that you're able to disclose? Yeah, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't go into secret, but I will go into impressive, uh, just really, uh, when you do this for four or five years, what really hit me uh, uh, almost emotionally was in Cherbourg, France, at the 40th anniversary of the Normandy landing, 
Marine One comes in and lands, uh, as you saw, a, a beautifully orchestrated approach and landing. President Reagan walks down the steps, um, and they're playing um, the national anthem. And the French acrobatic demonstration team roars overhead with red, white, and blue smoke. Oh, wow. Wow, that's amazing. Hard to beat that. Yeah. Gene says, what years did you serve with HMX1? Yeah, 1980 to 1985. Um, normally kind of a four-year tour. Uh, hung around an extra year. I kind of liked what I was doing, and they, they put up with me for an extra year. So Rick says, are the president and vice president ever allowed to fly together on Marine One or another aircraft? Yeah. Um, the easy answer is no. Uh, whatever the staff and White House military office coordinate will happen. Uh, it has, Marine One has been in the air the same time Marine Two has been in, in the air. Yes, the president is allowed to fly in other aircraft, um, needs of the White House, not necessarily a VH-3, but always by Marine Helicopter Squadron One pilots. So we have a question from Jimmy, um, and he says, did you know that there was a seamstress that lived in Pensacola who sewed all the seats in Marine One? I did not know that, Jimmy, uh, and thanks for the information. I'll have to um, keep that in my bag of uh, tricks for our visitors. Thanks. <laughs> and so we have one last question, and this kind of goes into your time after the Marines. Um, did you fly after your Marines and your time in Marine One? Uh, yes, I, I did 20 years in the Marine Corps. I flew some other aircraft after leaving. I retired, and then I went into a medical helicopter flying for 26 years. Finished up right here in Pensacola with Life Flight, my last 13. And actually, I missed one great question here from our good friend Jerry Guile. And he says, is it true that Jackie Kennedy was upset because Marine pilots were wearing a fire retardant flight suit in case of a crash. That, that's amazing, Jerry. Uh, um, I found something that Jerry doesn't know. Uh, it, is, it is entirely possible. If you watch all the video online, you'll see the pilots uh, normally in their blues, um, just like our crew chief does here. You'll see them in short sleeve shirts, always with the headset. That is entirely possible. That is entirely possible. Well, thanks for uh, visiting our History Up Close uh, series today. It's really been fun doing this. Please come to visit us and check out our other aircraft and the fabulous displays. Have a good day. Thank you all again so much for joining us for History Up Close. We, our next production will be the SBD Dauntless with Hill Goodspeed on Thursday, June 4th at 11 a.m. Central Time. Again, the SBD Dauntless with Hill, Thursday, June 4th, 11 a.m. Mark your calendars and have a wonderful day. That's a wrap.